morning. It's Vaughan at westcobellpottery.ca. Um, I'm doing a workshop in Newfoundland with some people and um, I wanted to um, get some things shown on a video quickly uh, about hand building some pieces that they could use in the workshop because those people who can throw will be making lots of pieces but hand building takes longer. So I want to give a heads up on what pieces we can try and make and decorate. So it'll be three or four plates um, in different techniques that I'm going to show in this video. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is roll out a slab. Uh, if you have a slab roller, bully for you. <laughs> anyway, if you don't have a slab roller, you'll have to use a rolling pin and two sticks to roll the slab with two sticks either side with a rolling pin in the middle and you can actually roll a slab the thickness of the two sticks. Uh, there we go. Slab roller is a really useful tool if you've got the space for it, but it takes up quite a bit of space in a studio. I've got mine tucked underneath the shelf system here um, and uh, I have another one over there actually but I don't use that one very much but uh, I'm just cutting this at an angle so it's thicker at one side and thinner at the other just so we've got a nice um, slope for the, the roller to go up and I roll on a piece of plastic so it's easier to lift them off the slab roller so I put this down on the piece of plastic which is just a regular thin piece of I don't know what mill it is but it's very it's not really thin but it's not really tough either um, and then I put the blanket over the top, pull the blanket from the other side till the clay touches the roller, and then if you're lucky, it will roll straight away. Um, and then, of course, you dip it in the right direction. And then I always pull it back through. It evens up the stress in the clay a little bit. That's what I was told. Now I'm rolling just under, sorry, just over a quarter of an inch. And you can do uh, thinner than that, but I wouldn't go too thin because uh, the clay won't support itself. And you have to decide what am I going to use it for? Well, I've got a whole bunch of little styrofoam molds here. Let's see if this is big enough. Oh wow, that one's really good. Off. Place it on the board here. We've, we now have a styrofoam piece, which is actually beveled a little bit, so it's it's not just a square, um, and it would fit perfectly like that inside here. Um, and this one is quite an easy project because you can just slump mold it right over the top of this and paddle it. Um, but uh, I think you need to texture the clay first. Okay, so I have lots of things to texture with. Stamps and little rollers, some are called thumb rollers, where you just do that across your clay, and other ones are just press in. I've got fish, uh, whatever I want to use, basically. So lots of choices. And then if you don't want to make your own, you can just go to Kemper or a bunch of other people and buy a bunch of rollers uh, that have textures. Of course, these become commercially, so your work looks like the neighbors as well. And uh, so it's kind of nice to have some stamps of your own. Even you can you double up and use some of these and some of those. Um, so I'm gonna try and do a bit of everything. Um, let's get my rib. Just gonna smooth it out. Oh, the clay body I'm using is number 80 from Laguna. So it's a cone six. There we go. And it will fire a sort of, not a chocolate brown, but a sort of a, a lightish brown color, which I don't like as much as terracotta clays. Um, but, uh, but this fires so much higher and any ter terracotta clay that goes to cone six is gonna look chocolate. So this is a little lighter in color than, than what terracotta would fire. Cone six would probably melt terracotta clay anyway.
Okay, so I have totally messed this up. <laughs> I've basically covered it with all sorts of random things. Uh, so that anything is possible, you can be a very minimalist, or you can be abstract, you can do, you know, figurative, like a little aquarium kind of thing, whatever you want to do anyway. So it's really just a matter of you choose what you want to do, and then just go ahead and do it. Then, I'm going to put this over the top of there, and I'm going to put a little bit of cling film over the mold first. Okay, so I have put cling film over this. And you can tape it over if you want to make sure it doesn't move. Um, and you place that down over there. And now, if I'm very careful, you can flip it. I've got another board underneath here. And peel the play off the plastic off very carefully. And sometimes it'll make a fold and tear the clay, so be careful. You want to make sure that the plastic doesn't get a little crease or fold at the edge like that, and then tear the clay. It's amazing how a desk gets messed up. If you've got a lot of people working and all close together, be careful you don't push things into the, your neighbor's area and actually um, annoy them because tables can get filled up very quickly. So I got myself a little banding wheel. Put that there. Let's get rid of this a minute. Now, you're going to cut this down a little bit because I like it to not be, you could make it so that it has a rim if you want to, let's just play with it first before I do anything I guess. So I'm paddling it down, which is why I put the cling film there, because it won't stick to the mold. So the stick gets a little bit wet, so make sure that as it's paddling it, that it doesn't start sticking to the clay, because that would actually, um, you'd be lifting it back off the clay instead of just paddling it to the mold. And then you might want to smooth out the bottom. And then, you can decide if you want to have a little bit of a rim, and there's enough clay there that I've got a little bit of a rim, I think. So I'm going to cut to that distance. Little edges cleaned off. I can tighten up that edge just by paddling a little bit. I may still have to do some trimming or sponging a little bit to clean up the edge when I get it off the mold. Um, it was a bit close on one side, so I may end up trimming and not having a rim anyway. It depends on how much clay was left over. And now you have to leave this for a little while. But there's one other thing you can do. If you want to, you can add some feet to it. And that could be anything you want. We have all this extra clay that we just used. So you could make yourself a little coil. You know, just a, a sort of thickness of, um, of a thick finger. And this depends on your clay body. If you're using a smooth white clay, um, if you're going to be using MCS or something white, um, like a porcelain style clay, B-Mix 5 or um, even 516 from Pottery Supply House, which is a white, very white 
um, smooth white clay. It doesn't have any strength in at cone six to hold its shape, um, so it would warp if it was a large flat platter kind of thing, and so putting feet on it wouldn't make sense unless you did it all the way around. But if you've got a gritty clay, which is his number 80, this one doesn't warp very much at all. So you could actually put some feet on these. So I've made enough clay there where I could actually put six feet. Um, let's just cut it. And then carefully judge so you've actually got the same thickness, obviously. So I have six feet squished a little bit with the knife and I'm going to get some water, but I can place these where I want them to be. So it would lift your little dish off the table. So if you put hot food in it um, and put it on the table, varnished tables without tablecloth would actually get that little pale milky look to them. The varnish would sort of milk, go milky. It's not good. So if you've got feet on something, um, that wouldn't happen because your heat is being distributed with air underneath. And then you would just stick them on there. So this is brand new clay, just thrown, sorry, just rolled out. See, I'm a thrower, you see. Yeah. It's in habit. So I'm just adding a little bit of water to the bottom of each one, rubbing it to make a little slip. And they're very flat, so there's no way any air is going to get trapped underneath there. So the brush the bristles are just rubbing in some slip to lift it up in from the clay and then now I'm just going to rotate them until they really stick because that way the water that's on there is actually blending with the thing underneath and you can tell you'll feel when it sticks so no scoring no scratching don't you hate that we had a pottery class when I was at high school where the teacher would give us things to do and he would make us score and scratch everything three, four times till you really got like built up a big slip. Um, and I found out when I started doing things for myself that if you just work with the clay in that sweet part spot where it's firm but, but not drying, then you can still join things just by a tiny bit of water with no scoring and scratching. It certainly speeds things up a lot. Now, um, you can play with these, you can square them off, or you can have them round, whatever you want to do. In the past, I've actually used a, a, a wiggly wire and cut them down the sides to make them, so I've made them a lot taller, actually, in the past, which is what I'm talking about here. And then you can do a wiggle wire, cut down, 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 down four sides, and you end up with this kind of really nice striped uh, foot. But anyway, this has to firm up a little bit so that it actually can go to the next step. So I'm going to show you a, a different one next. Okay, I have rolled out this piece of clay with a rolling pin to get the right width. And I've thickened up the, the left edge and the right edge. So when I roll it, it will actually be a little bit more square-like rather than oval. measured it so this fits perfectly on the top with about half an inch either side because the clay will roll out and make it a bit wider anyway so it's perfect for this mold that I want to use it. Okay so we got a piece that's almost 16 inches long and it's about uh, 12 and a half uh, 13 inches wide. Does it fit? Fits perfectly. So I judged it just about right. A uh, little bit of extra clay here that I won't need. So let's get my knife again. 
I've got two of these because I'll always lose the first one. So there we go. Little pieces you can peel off like that. I would never try peeling the clay off the plastic. You always peel pl plastic off clay. So little pieces like that you can get away with. All right, so um, this is going to be placed on here. Take the slab and carefully place it on top. And hopefully you get a nice on it, make sure it's got a, I just want to leave enough to get a little bit of a rim. There we go. So that's on there. Peel it off horizontally, smooth out the back. And now I'm going to try to do that little slight curve. Remember, just feel for the edge where you know you've got it. Just going to leave a little bit. And then you can use your finger if you want, just to kind of, kind of get rid of any kind of imperfections. Use the heel of your hand smooth too but that's a plate which we can then do whatever we want to um, it's not stuck because it's on newspaper so be careful when you pick it up you don't slide it off um, you can put little feet on this again if you want. If you want, you can tap them. And that's the second one. Okay, I have uh, one of those large, let me show you here. They sell these at craft stores, fabric stores. They're cushions that, you know, putting underneath your sofa or something to raise the height. But anyway, uh, for people who do upholstery, maybe. Uh, but they're soft, you can squeeze them. But as a big surface area, it's kind of hard to push in, which is why it works as a cushion uh, when you're sitting on it. But anyway, um, I have a big one of these underneath there. And I've put a thin piece of plastic, it's wrapped in plastic anyway, but I've got a thin piece of plastic on top of it, so it'll be easy to pull it off here. And then I've got some newspaper on top of that, thanks to Uline, uh, to actually uh, um, make sure it doesn't stick to the plastic. And then I have my rolled out sheet, which I'm going to measure. before I do anything to it. So I want to make sure it's going to fit nicely. This is my big mold. I have an assortment of these. I've made them, it's basically a two by four with a piece of plywood beveled on the edges so it looks nice. Um, I bought these at, um, what was it? This one I made, this one I bought at uh, Michael's Crafts. Not sure what they use it for. Same with that one. And the same with that one. I bought them at Michael's Crafts. So, uh, so it should be available everywhere. I'm not sure what they use them for. All right, I'm gonna use the one I made myself. So it's gonna be that size. So I wanna make sure it fits nicely. I'm gonna give myself like, a, I would say um, two centimeters wider than the board. Go down in there. I'm going to try and even it up as much as possible before I do the pressing. That's not so bad now. 
All right, so we know it fits nicely. I'm now gonna, oh, that's why I wanna smooth it. Peel off horizontally. So I have my clank fill. This means this won't stick to a piece of clay. Place it right in the center, making sure that you've got a nice equal edge all the way around. And then what you do is you lean on this with your entire body weight so that you can press down and maybe you'll have to push two, maybe three times, but just keep doing it till you see the rim lifts really well. All right, now I'm going to slide it onto my wooden board and we have an instant rim. And you could push up a little bit more if you want to. But you can actually then pull your plastic back and lift this off. And we can get rid of this big thing. And now peel off your cling film. Usually this stuff gets better if it's been used a couple of times it loses the static and then you can peel the paper down so you can see then that you have this nice instant rim I'm just going to set this aside. I have a board with paper put together. I've rolled another slab out, which is too big for what I want. Now I want to talk about these. I have a whole box full of these. Um, different shapes, rounds, ovals, squares, rectangles. Um, you can cut them any, any size you want. It's basically the foam that they use for insulating houses. Uh, and they sell it in two inch thick sheets, or this is a one inch thick sheet. Um, and it makes great molds. Um, so I have a little band saw, but you don't need that. You can use a regular saw if you want to. But I could make little wiggly cuts, I mean, on a band saw, and you can really kind of make some funky molds. Uh, but they make great um, ways of making some plates and, and little dishes. So I just have to make sure it's the right size. So this is gonna go on there, and I wanna have a rim again, just a little hangover. So I'm going to cut it so it feels like it's square. So I've got enough there, so I'm going to have to cut over this side a little bit. Take this little piece off here. There we go. Let's lift this one off for a later date. this and it's loaded with clay. I'm not sure if you've seen one of these before. It's the same principle as a caulking gun that the construction and industry uses, only it's got clay inside. So if it works still, we'll see, I haven't used this in a long time. Looks like it's working. You can make coils with it. Doing this so you don't make it wiggle like that is just to do this. If it's got air bubbles in, it will break, so make sure you wedge the clay first. I think that's long enough. So I'm gonna snap it off. So we've got a nice even coil. 
I'm going to put it about an inch in. And it's a good idea to place it without tacking it at first so you can move it again. And you, I'm going to break it off a bit too big. And then I'm going to take a look at it, make sure it's even. And then here, I'm going to bevel, just push the clay in a bit, so I can rest this against it. And then I can cut it off. Let's make sure before I cut it off. So now that one is just going to rest against there. All right. Maybe push the extra pushing on that little bit there. Um, now you can do a variety of ways of doing this, but you can actually use the back of your fingernail and just tack it in a few places. This is one of my ribs that I cut down to size. You can go around now. Now I'm going to slide it onto this bat. Put it on the wheel. Let's get it that underneath. And now, with a sponge that's a little soft and not too wet, let's show you what I mean. It's got water in it, so I'm just wringing it out so it stops dripping. And then I use a finger either side of the coil and I start with a tiny bit of pressure pulling around and then I gradually when it becomes slippery enough I'm increasing the pressure just a touch I don't want to thin the coil I'm pressing at the base of the coil where it's joined to the slab to try gradually smooth that coil, get rid of all the fingerprints so it's a nice join and totally smooth. And then I can do the outside just by pressing in. Round several times. see any of the join left. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a nice, use a clean part of the sponge and you can just go around one more time and just kind of make sure you don't have any bumps. And then the inside, just kind of smooth it out. So I would simply place this paper, care of line. over my pot, I place a board over, so it's center, it's centered, so I make sure that you can get that fairly centered. And then you, with a little bit of effort, be very careful, hold them together and just flip. Then you can take rid of this board. And now, without tearing the clay, Make sure, remember, if this clay, fall, the plastic falls at either end, it will eventually tear the clay as it falls across. So keep watching left, the two edges to make sure they don't have a crease that will tear the clay. 
and then rinse your sponge. And this is why I don't make these out of too thin a clay because the, if it's really soft and really thin, it'll just flop down. So what you're doing is you're sponging to the coil with your fingers, just holding the rim and pulling up a little bit. And the bigger the rim you make, the more support you might need, depending on the softness of the clay. And that's it. Now, the rim is holding. You can see it's holding up. But how much of a rim do you want it to go up? How much angle do you want? There's a trick you can do, which I'll show you next. Squish it. You can place it underneath and just push a touch and it lifts the rim up. So you flatten it, oval it out a little bit. Push it down so it goes under. And it will lift the rim up. That's why water is not so great because it keeps the clay soft for a while. You can also use bits of clay, obviously. All right, so this one's just going to be stiffening up, and we have the other ones that I've done that are stiffening up too. So I place it over there. Put a piece of paper over it. That's about the right size, so we'll measure it. And then there's a little bit out of there, so I'm just going to curve that one in too. So that's the right size. You can texture this now. Do something really quick just because we have something here. Oh, I know what's nice. Gives a sort of water look. Place that right in the center. Turn it over. Take that up a bit higher. Take off your paper. Take your paddle. fillers and then they sell I mean we can't every time we put these out they start selling so if you're gonna fire your kiln and you've got space in the kiln make a bunch of these they will sell and you put nice glazes on them and you texture them nicely just put it just about on there it'll sit fully nicely You lift it out and you've got yourself a nice tray, just have to clean the rim up. Yeah, I could see a few green beans hanging inside this. So it's just a small serving tray. And once again, if you feel like the rim like that side should be hanging down a bit, 
So your toilet rolls come in handy. That one's a bit thick. The thinner ones are better. Okay, um, I've got the other ones to peel off, but this, this was basically just to show you how to hand build some pieces that we can use some decorating techniques on for slip. Uh, so the ones that have texture like this are uh, not really meant for the slip work, but um, we need a smooth surface to work on for slip. So as the piece dries out, we just need to sponge the rim a little bit. This is just that little kiln filler, but it's about two hours since I did these. So it's still pretty soft, but it's firmed up enough. So all I do with these is, you know, I, I keep the work down to the minimum because they're just inexpensive little functional pieces. And this is the square one. It's firmed up a little bit now, so we can remove these. These are so useful, just make sure you don't throw them out because they're just the rolls inside the cling film or paper towel. And I sometimes put finger and um, underneath finger roll with a spongy maintain and you can really give it to a nice smoothing. Give it a bit of pressure on with your finger. I think this was the one where I felt like this edge here was a little weaker than the others, but I think I'm going to leave it because it's not that bad. This is the one that's still a little bit too soft, like I can really squeeze these easily. So if I took the, flipped it the right way up and took the mold out, it would not support itself, I don't think, at this moment. So just kind of smooth it out a little bit. Now there's a couple of things you can do to it for these feet. So on this piece I'll show you the wiggle wire. So what I do with this is just pull it up And it's a, a way of just, you know, I like to make people think that I thought about the parts of the pot that everybody else would ignore. You don't have to worry about it. You can actually use, I mean, anything. You don't want anything sharp because it goes through, but you could literally... If it's got feet, we're going to glaze the bottom. There you go. So I think you can see that. And then just do that to make sure there's nothing sharp. That's why I use a soft end of a paintbrush. And then just sit it up. And then you just have to hope and say a prayer. You're guessing about the firmness of the clay. is holding up not bad and then you gotta sponge the edge of the piece I get it wet at this point so carefully do this and like I said you can now cut if you feel unhappy about your edge you can just cut it back to what you want and I use the point of my finger to squish against the edge of the rim just to kind of blunt it this has a Nice curve going out, but then it came in too short there, but I think I kind of don't mind it. A lot of stuff that we do is nice to remind people it's handmade, but if it looks like a mistake, then you should get rid of it. So you have a choice. And you'll get feedback from your customers sometimes if you've left something and they say, well, is that a second? <laughs> you know, you've got to do something about it. Too late at that point. And then just without running any water in there, just run this over the texture. Okay, so why did I do a texture of one? I think what I could do at this point, if I wanted a really time-consuming uh, piece, is I could do a layer of white slip over this, just paint it over the whole thing, and when it's dry, almost dry, you could take a piece of emery wool 
uh, sandpaper would block up too quick, but emery wool and do this outside with a mask, um, you could simply brush away the white slip that's on the upper areas. Um, so you'd be left with the white in the recessed areas. And so it would be a nice pattern that you could get, but it, it's, it's a project I would do outside wearing a mask. But that was the idea of texturing. The texture. So I'm basically going to rub the surface of this with wire wool to try and get the top area away. Um, if there's any thick areas, just brush them out quickly. Okay, I'm going to coat a layer of white slip over this, and this is about judgment. I don't want to have to be able to pour this off afterwards, so I'm going to pour just enough into cover which is a bit of a guess. So I'm just gonna use a sponge. You have to do this just to get a feel for it. Of course, the texture of this is kind of nice as well. Okay, so we've got that. Let's get the brush again. This one um, is still a little bit um, bendable, but not much. So I'm going to be cautious with it, but I don't think I need to worry about it. So I'm gonna put these back. Now, if you can airbrush, it's the best. But if you can't airbrush, and Badger makes an airbrush 250 dash something or other, um, and that's the one I use because it's an external mix airbrush. Um, and you can do it outside, uh, or you can do it, you can't do it in the winter outside because the liquid would freeze, obviously. Um, but basically, uh, wear a mask once again. I'll do a second coat on these later on. Okay, this is about an hour later and I'm gonna try and flip this one now. So we flip it. No, I don't think that's... And then you've got to sponge the edges. Now, in the actual um, demonstration I'm going to do at a workshop, I'm going to use stencils on some of these, and a variety of stencils can be used. Um, so I won't go into that yet, because you can go from being abstract expressionist to totally figurative. So the yellow is a stain that I used decades ago, but you can buy one from Mason Stain. This is a ferro frit stain that they stopped producing a long time ago. And I've, I bought a bunch of it, so I still have enough for my lifetime, I hope. So I've had like three coats of white and uh, one coat of yellow. And, and when I airbrush, you get a nice thicker coat. Uh, with brushing, you're brushing and it pulls some off as well. So with the brushing, it takes longer. This one, the feet started to push up a little bit because I think the clay got a little soft but it'll still work. You'll notice when I do the lines and I carve that each line will have this little yellow kind of um, edge to it, which I always think is quite nice. Okay, here's a little personal trick that I do. Um, and the reason for it is to make it less expensive. 
Um, this is my black slip that I've just mixed up, which is cheap to mix up. Uh, five gallons, basically, it's not that expensive. And I've got enough, enough for about eight to ten colors this size from five gallons, and you add stain to each one for a different color. Uh, but for the black, um, I found that the Amico underglaze mixed uh, one quarter to three quarters slip um, makes a darker black and it's uh, less expensive than using underglaze. Now underglaze would be absolutely the best thing to use on the, tur on the surface because it's so easy to scratch through, there's no body to it. Um, whereas slip has an actual thickness, uh, some body, so so I try not to paint a very thick layer of black slip on top because it's harder to carve through because you've really got one layer of yellow and I've got three layers of, of white over the red clay. Now if I was airbrushing it would be one, the red clay with two sprayings of underglaze white, sorry slip white, and then one layer of yellow sprayed over the top and then one layer of black. Um, so brushing makes it more time consuming, um, um, but I do think that uh, I still want to make this black a little nicer. Come on, out. There you go. So I'm adding one quarter black underglaze to this, and then just stir it up, and you'll see it gets much darker anyway, just in this. So this is now a blacker black. It's Mason 6600 stain, um, so it should come out darker, I'm hoping anyway, and all that, because I didn't add 10% just about uh, black stain. But it's also, it's dripping now, so it'll be a little easier to brush as well. Because um, the underglaze, for some reason, it tends to make it go a little more runny. Not runny, but um, it, it flows easier. I add vinegar to slip if I want to thicken it up. Um, and you can add water to slip to thin it, obviously. Now, I'm not seeing any yellow through the black, um, but I'm going to let this dry, and then I'll take another look. And I, Because the slip's so thin, we're not going to get a big, thick coat anyway. Uh, I might do a second coat and just see, um, because I don't see any yellow, but as it dries, you might have that tendency to be a little bit brush strokey, because I can see cross brush strokes and this way and that way, so that might show up a little bit because in the firing, slips tend to go a little bit more transparent. I'm not sure, but I think you can just about see that there's some yellow poking through in those areas just there. So that's why it will need a second coat. Okay, I just finished sanding this piece. I just used a piece of wire wool uh, and rubbed it in, the spray, in my spray booth with a fan running so the dust goes outside off the uh, So get, get rid of all that bad dust. Um, but anyway, just lightly rub it, being very careful because it's bone dry now, but it gives you a kind of a fossil-like look. Um, and this will fire dark red brown with the white slip, so it'll be much more contrasty. Um, and you can glaze it then with any kind of glaze you want.